I move and ask uh, un for unanimous consent for permission to speak upon the topic of crossing the Rubicon. Uh, no objections. Go ahead, uh, Senator Dunley. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> um, I, like some of you, are a student of history. Actually, I, it was my degree was history. And um, if we forget our history, we're doomed to uh, repeat some major mistakes here in the present and the future. 49 BC is when Julius Caesar crossed the Rubicon. We've heard that term before, that phrase before. But it's rooted in history, it's rooted in facts. The, um, up until that time, the, uh, there was a standing law in Rome under the Roman Republic that you're supposed to leave your armies north of the Rubicon. Don't bring them into Rome because they were worried that you know, there may be a takeover of the government. Well, Julius Caesar decided to cross the Rubicon with his army, and we know what happened. Julius Caesar, in essence, became one of the first emperors, followed by a succession of others. And some would say that at that point, when Rome went from being a republic to an empire, and power was accumulated into one individual, in the one individual's hands, the, uh, the republic that we have known started to go downhill, and roughly 500 years later collapsed. <clears throat> in 1776, it was also a watershed. I hopefully everybody in here knows what happened in 1776, Mr. President. Uh, there was a war. Some call it the revolution, but others call it a civil war because it really wasn't a war against a foreign country. It was a war of its own citizens against, again, a government that was somewhat despotic, would not listen to the grievances of the colonists at the time who were Americans who were British. Things like the Stamp Act, things like the tea, uh, tea uh, tax, quartering soldiers in people's homes without permission during peacetime, et cetera, et cetera. Much of this later became embedded in our Constitution and other uh, papers of our founding fathers. <clears throat> they too were concerned about a faraway government with power accumulated in the hands of one individual dictating their lives. Especially when he was over there, we were over here, and we had a better idea as to how to deal with our land. Um, Alaska is purchased, as we know, uh, under, uh, under William Seward because he thought and sold it to Congress and the president at the time that um, it could be a storehouse for minerals, help power economically this country, and also as a bulk work against the uh, British. The Russians were concerned about the British coming in from Canada. So as we know, we purchased, purchased Alaska, the very state we live in today at the time was a territory. For some time it was a military district without very much representation. Folks from Washington told us what to do. Folks from Washington basically ruled Alaska. So as we move towards trying to get a form of uh, government here in Alaska where we would have some representation, we go through uh, the first organic act, the second organic act, and we start heading towards statehood. Before we got there, in 1906, just an aside, there was a little act that uh, has come back to haunt many of us in the western states, including Alaska, called the Antiquities Act. It was passed under Teddy Roosevelt's um, administration. And what people need to understand about the Antiquities Act, and you'll see why I'm bringing it up, is the purpose of that act was really simple at the time. Chaco Canyon in New Mexico was being pilfered of its Indian artifacts. And this was a way to stop that. It was never intended, Mr. President, to be a catch-all and a be-all for a land grab by the President of the United States. The 1906 law enabled, Congress enabled the president, fortunately or unfortunately, through proclamation to proclaim certain lands to be set aside. In 1943, I believe, that act was amended because in Wyoming, under a huge protest by folks in Wyoming, Jackson Hole was added to the Grand Teton uh, National Park. And, National Park. Um, and the folks at that time, like uh, again, it was such an uproar that they, uh, uh, we were able to get Americans, were able, uh, the Congress was able to get the, um, the act amended. Then we fast forward to 1980. We all know what happened in 1980. In the waning days of a president, President Carter, there was another massive land grab here in Alaska. Huge protest. Not only did we have enough parks at the time, but we added preserves, monuments, refuge, scenic water, or wildlife uh, rivers, et cetera, et cetera. The lands that we were promised under statehood, the lands that we were promised under the compact, and as we know, a compact is a promise, is an agreement between us and Congress, us and the federal government. The federal government has not lived up to that promise. So just when you think it's going to stop and things will get better, it gets worse. And if uh, permission to read briefly from a short list. 
Mr. Greiden. So these are examples of what have happened here in the very you know, past quarter century. Logging, logging in the Tongass, gone, no more. <clears throat> Mineral development in southwest Alaska, no. Oil exploration in Bristol Bay, nope. Management of staying on fishing game on federal lands and waters, mm, probably not. Ownership of submerged highlands and navigable waters, nope. Use of our historic RS-2477 rights away, nope. Transportation corridors uh, for federal conservation units, nope. Reasonable and consistent regulations for development, no. Snow machine access to Denali Park, nope. Road to emergency health care in King Cove, not going to happen. Floatplane landings in some parts, of the, uh, some parts and preserves in the state, nope. Meaningful, call, meaningful consultation with the state of Alaska, no. Uh, and in um, honoring the 90-10 revenue split, resources on federal lands. So we fast forward to this last, last week and a half here, and as we know, I, I'm not going to repeat exactly what happened because you just have to read the paper, but the point I'm trying to make is this. Um, if we don't take a stand in Alaska, this will continue, and it appears to be accelerating. We're a, and before anyone accuses me of wanting to form an insurrection, I'm, I'm not there. Um, however, I do believe that Alaska <clears throat> should follow some of, the, um, some of the civil rights leaders that we've had in this country, from Do Dr. Martin Luther King and others, that when there is such an egregious wrong being foisted upon the backs of a people, and in this case a state, we need to do something about it. We need to do something about it beyond protesting, beyond uh, press conferences. We need to do something so we can help put an end to this, because if we don't, it's going to continue. And whether we want to believe it or not, if we really think about it, it doesn't matter what party you belong to, what part of the state belong, you belong to, but if we don't really think about this, we will lose our sovereignty. This is one of the few examples that I can think of in which Congress originally their idea was when they came into possession of land, such as in the old Northwest with the old Northwest Ordinance Act, which is the upper Midwest, they figured out a way to dispose that land to become states. We wanted states. We didn't want to rule over people. But this is one of the few examples where it would appear that the federal government is trying to take back as much land as it possibly can, take back as much possession of our resources. And really, if one was a conspiracy theorist, would, would, would think that the federal government, under our current president, is trying to strangle Alaska's economic future. We hear all the time, Mr. President, we have relatives down south, some of us, and we have friends, we hear all the time in the press that all Alaska does is have their hand out with the federal government. All we want is more money from the federal government. Well, when you're reduced to a beggar because you're not allowed to <clears throat> develop your resources the way you know best, Sometimes that leaves you little chance. So I'd like to conclude by saying this is not going to go away. This may fade off of the headlines for a little while, but it's not going to go away. And like a former president in 1980, in the waning years of this president's administration, there is no doubt that there will be continued attempts to take away Alaska's lands, to take away Alaska's right to, take, to develop its lands, to take care of itself, and to basically take away its sovereignty. And I know when folks hear that phrase, they think of black helicopter folks and people that live in bunkers. It's happening all the time at an accelerated rate. And I would ask this body to give some serious thought to going beyond just talking about it, to going beyond just press conferences, to going beyond just, all oh, shucks, there they go again. If we don't take a stand, it's going to continue, Mr. President. And I'm afraid that someone's going to stand behind this podium someday in the near future and um, be putting forth a, a, a change for the state of Alaska to become the uh, Alaska National Park of the United States. Uh, and with that, I'm going to close and just once again, we need to think about putting an end to this because this has gotten out of control. And I, I, I implore this body, I implore our federal delegation to don't take this laying down because this state's future, the future of our kids, the future of our grandchildren are at stake. So with that, Mr. President, um, thank you.